Lord, we are so grateful that you redeemed us. You redeemed us, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Father, I come this morning before we open the word. And I know if you're here this morning and you have an unsaved son or daughter or someone that you're praying for, just stay standing. Father, we come. And it grieves my heart, even in my own family, my God, that you would draw our sons and our daughters into covenant relationship and not a pseudo-Christianity where attend a service or give lip service, but truly a reformed heart that loves you, my God, that is born of your spirit and walks with you, my God. Draw our sons and daughters. Draw that unsaved spouse. I know there are many in this congregation, or I should say at least a few in this congregation, whose spouses are not saved and the turmoil that it causes in the home. Lord God, that you would draw them into covenant relationship. Almighty God, they'd be equally yoked for their families, Lord, for grandchildren, that they would come, for siblings, that they would come, for those who have parents, that they would come to the table, my God, and know they're forgiven and that you love them with an eternal love that we can't even understand, my God. Lord, we just ask for unsaved loved ones today. Oh, God, just move upon their hearts. And Lord God, help us to be that witness because we don't know who else is praying and you put us in the pathway of their loved one, Lord. And they're crying out to God that someone will witness to their mom or dad or child. Use us, Lord, in the days we live in. Let us not be fearful. Let us not be embarrassed. But, Lord God, that we would share that gospel with all that we come in contact with. Every person we meet is a divine appointment. Help us, O oh God. Help us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you and knowing you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hello, Randy and Paul. It's good to see you guys. Happy New Year. Hello, Sebi and Susie. All right. Woohoo! Praise the Lord. Hello, Joseph. Hiding over there in the corner. Well, good morning again, church. Praise the Lord. So uh, we went through our prayer requests. We did our bulletin. And so now we can get into the Word of God. Hola, Senora. Como esta? Good. That's about all I know. All right? But it gets me through. And especially, look at me. No one knows. If I put a, oh, yes, release the Kraken. I mean, release the children. Oh, that was... Uh, <laughs> no, we won't go there. Um, all right. Kids are on their way. That's good. There goes the little one. There goes Adriana. All right, so we're back into Philippians after the Christmas season and New Year's season. And uh, uh, for those who saw my email on New Year's, uh, keep looking up. That's, that's what we need to focus on. The things of this world will get a little crazy, but God's in control, amen? So praise the Lord. So this morning, we'll continue our study in Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we left off a couple of weeks ago looking at who the Christian's perfect example is that we are to emulate when it comes to humility, selflessness, servanthood, and obedience. And of course, that's none other than who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect example, amen? Now, the reason Paul elaborates on the ministry of the Lord is to rebuke the conditions of selfishness an empty conceit that is so normal to our sin nature, if you will, that can actually make its way into a believer's life and into the church. Do you hear me? These things will only lay the groundwork for disunity, disruption, and division, and can actually create the downfall of a local expression. And as I thought about this, not only a local expression, but can cause divisions in an entire denomination, if you will. And the one thing we will look forward to in heaven is there's no denominations. It's just Christians who love the Lord. Amen? And Paul's message is this. Like Christ, we need to see ourselves as bondservants to God as well as bondservants to others. And if we can get that mindset, we would get along a lot better in life, and especially with other folks. Amen? And in doing so, we will avoid the influence of both selfishness and empty conceit as we put 
obedience to the will of God and the needs of others above, above our own will and desires. Something very hard to do in the flesh, and I said this, it's impossible to do in the flesh, but in the spirit, conceivable, if we're willing to, ready, obey and submit to the Holy Spirit. Because in our flesh, we ain't going to want to do it. Now, with that said, Paul will continue this thought to emulate Christ as he now proceeds to address not only the believers in Philippi, but all believers concerning this subject. So if you will, turn to Philippians 2, um, and we're going to look at verses uh, 12 to 18, and we're going to begin with verses 12 and 13. So when you're all there on your pages or your phone or your little tablets, whatever you use today. All right, so it reads this. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And what we see here in verse 12 is Paul's exhortation to believe it, to walk in obedience so as to grow in maturity and become more like Christ, which is the Father's ultimate purpose for every one of us, is to be more like Jesus. That is the ultimate goal for us, all right? And it tells us that in Romans 8, 28 and 29. Listen carefully, for us, as believers in Christ, one of the greatest sources of joy, and I'm going to read it, should be the acknowledgement by the evidence of our lives and lifestyles that we are pleasing our Lord by walking in obedience to his word and demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It should be our joy when we see that we're maturing in Christ and becoming more like him because that's God's ultimate purpose for us. Amen? So it's good. It's good. It's a good kind of I don't want to say feel good, but, oh, I'm striving, I'm working towards, and I'm becoming more like Christ, amen? And that should bring joy to us because it pleases our Father and it pleases the Lord, amen? amen. And listen, for any pastor as an under-shepherd of God's flock or any teacher of God's word, it's a great source of joy to see those under your ministry growing and maturing in Christ. That means we're doing what we're supposed to do, Amen? Listen to what John says in 2 John verse 1, bless you. Verse 4, it says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. This is John the Apostle, and what he's saying is, I find joy to know that those that I've witnessed to, to those that I've taught, are becoming more like Jesus, drawing closer to Jesus. It gives the teacher, it gives the apostle, it gives the pastor, the shepherd, joy to see the flock maturing. Because if you're not, then I need to leave this pulpit and the teacher needs to leave this uh, stand because God works through the pastors, through the Holy Spirit and the teachers to bring the word of God so people mature in the faith. Amen? Amen? And so as we go on, here in verse 12 of Philippians 2, Paul is expressing the same truth as the Apostle John. And again, he exhorts the believers, walk in obedience as you did when I was present with you, but now how much more that I'm not there because I'm still imprisoned in Rome. He's saying, not when my eyes are upon you and when I'm with you, but now that I'm not there, please walk in the obedience that I have taught you and spend time laboring over. And I was getting, you know, I was, we were sitting on a couch, Teresa and I, and I was letting this kind of percolate in my mind, as my pastor used to say. I never understood what he meant by that, but now I get it. And the Holy Spirit laid on my heart an analogy of our children. When they're with us in company or in the house, most of the time, unless you had Thomas for a son, they would, <laughs> they would be obedient and listen to what you had to say because they're with you and they either, they want to please you and be that little good boy or girl and get that tap on the head, or they're a little concerned that they're going to get the backhand of uh, knowledge, if you will. But they're usually obedient when they're with us. Most of the time. But here's the test. The real test of their obedience will come when we're not present, when we're not around to chastise or correct. You see, it's then that they have to make the conscious decision to apply what they have learned. Do you hear me? And what they've been taught. And if they do, they realize that they're growing in obedience to the and principles that their parents have taught them. So it's not just when our, when our eyes are on them, 
but when our eyes are not, are they going to walk in obedience? And that's what Paul is saying to the church. Now that I'm not with you, still walk in obedience. And it's the same with us, isn't it? We can put on our church face. We can talk the talk and do the behaviors on Sunday mornings or when we gather with fellowship with other believers, we can put on that nice, oh, look, I'm that Christian talk and put on the suit and do all those things. But the test comes in the everyday throes of life, in our home, in the workplace. And the real test will come when we look in the mirror and see, are we really walking the walk every day? Again, in our home, in the workplace. And the biggest time is in our alone time, when nobody else's eyes are upon us, when you're by yourself in the marketplace, or you're by yourself in the car and someone cuts you off, all right? Or when you're by yourself behind the computer or in front of the TV or on your phone. No one else may see you, but all I know is our God's omnipresent, and his eyes are on us, and he wants us to walk in obedience, amen? And listen, a good thing his eyes are on us because it's good for blessing, protection, healing, and for discipline. I'm glad that I can never leave the presence of my God, especially in the world we live in. I'm glad that his angels are around me and he knows everything that's going on. Amen? Listen to John 14, 15. It says, if. Now, this is a conditional statement. It's an if-then statement. He says, if you love me, this is Jesus speaking, you'll keep my commandments. Do you love him? Then what would you like to do? He says, keep my commandments. And then by doing that, for us as people, as we walk and we mature more like Christ and we're keeping his commandments, we see that we're growing and maturing in our faith as we're obedient to his will and his word. And we should desire to do that. Now listen to 1 John 2, 3 to 6. It says, by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So if we really love the Lord, it will be evidence because we should desire to be obedient. Not do it because we're under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But it's a love relationship. I brought it out. I love my wife and I do things because I want to please her. Amen? So I do the same thing with my bridegroom. I want to please him. And he says, if you keep my commandments and principles, you'll please me. And don't we want to do that? Don't we want to do that if he's our first love? And this actually segues into verse 13 as we rely on what is not only said in verse 12, but also in the previous verses that discuss Christ's humility and obedience. But this is what we're told in verses 6 to 8, that the Lord Jesus was obedient to his Father's will. He emptied himself of all those divine prerogatives and came to earth as a man, yes? And he, he became a bondservant. That's the lowest form of servant in a home, and he was obedient to death, even death on the cross, in order to fill the plan of the Father's redemption. You see, verse 12 begins... We have what is called a transition clause. Look what it says. So then, and this is translated from the Greek word hostis, and this actually acts as a bridge. That word acts as a bridge to all that is said previously about Christ's humility. It says, so then, like all that we saw in Christ's church, then we are to act and do in the same way to be Christ-like, which means not being selfish and full of empty conceit, but walking in humility, obedience, selflessness, etc. Amen? So, verse 13 is telling us our role model is our example. And who is that? It's Jesus Christ. And as we strive to become like him, we put the interest of others above our own. Because what did Jesus do? He put the interest of the entire humanity above his own when he came and went to the cross for us. And like him, we had to put the interest of others before our own and serve God. Amen? And then he instructs us this. He says, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hmm. And this kind of sounds controversial, if not understood, and it leads us into what I call, the title of my sermon, one of the greatest paradoxes in Christianity. Because we know, right? We know that First of all, let me give you what a paradox is. It's a situation, a person, or thing that combines contradictory features or qualities. And, and listen carefully, because this is where 
the providence of God intersects with the free will of man. That's the paradox. Where does that mix occur? And we know from Scripture that this, listen carefully, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the fundamental gospel, okay? Listen to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, For grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so no one can boast. We know that we are sinners saved by grace, that God provided that grace by sending his Son into the world to be the substitute for our sin. And we have to believe into that in order to be saved. So salvation's by grace through faith alone. Amen? Amen. And then John 6, 44 says this, No one can come to the Father and come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up on the last day. It's the Father who draws us. Amen? All right? Keep that in mind. And listen carefully. It's the work of the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. The grace of God, the Father, gives His Son. The Son did the work. The Holy Spirit convicts. Amen? But the person has to receive it. We have to receive the grace of God by faith. And it's up to us to receive it. It's within the free will of every person to either accept or reject the grace of God. So what do we see? We see a crossroad. God provides the grace and the way. But in the free will of man, we can accept or reject. We are not robots. Amen? Every person has the free will to say yes and receive Christ or no, not for me today. And in his foreknowledge, God knows those who will accept and those who will reject. We are not robots that when a flip, uh, switch is flipped, all of a sudden that day it's like, mm -hmm, I'm going to serve God. No, no, no. We have a free will to choose. Choose. But out of the free will to choose, listen to this, in the love and the bosom of God, he desires that all that are made in his image would come to salvation faith. Listen to 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. All to come to repentance. Everyone. Jesus died for the sins from Adam to the last person on the face of the earth. And he desires that all would come to repentance. And I love where it says that he's slow and patient towards us. Mike, 40-something years. I was 31 when I came to the Lord. And that life before, boy, I tell you, was not good. And if I would have died prior to that, I would have been in hell. But he's patient. And he keeps drawing. And keeps putting people in your pathway. He put this woman in our pathway when Teresa and I lived in Florida. My older brother praying for us for years. And for some unknown reason, we went to, right, on a Sunday Easter morning service, went to Neighborhood Assembly of God, Pastor Joe preached the message, and boy, it was like, whew, the Holy Spirit finally said, it's time. And it was time. Amen? So he's long-suffering. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen? All right, I got off on a tangent there. And as we go further, we see the same paradox when it comes to sanctification of the believer. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit will convict us when temptations lure, and he will confront us. But at that point, we can either listen and heed the voice of the Holy Spirit or turn a deaf ear to him. And we can go into that path of sin. Church, we still battle the residual effects of a sin nature, do we not? Our flesh. But on the foundation of God's word, we can stand on the fact that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we do not have to give in to that old flesh. We can crucify the flesh and live by the Spirit. That's what Galatians 5.16 tells us. Galatians tells us, walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And therefore we are told, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because we don't have to give in to the flesh. The power of God lives within us. But there's a lot of work we must do so that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And listen to 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you but that which is common to man. Do you think anything's changed since the garden? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Trace every sin right back to those three roots. Nothing's changed. All temptation is 
common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with temptation will provide the way of escape also. It's called grace, so that you'll be able to endure it. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no excuse. Well, nobody knows this, what I've been wrestling with. Oh, yeah, we do, because it's the same since the creation of the world. Family was saved by grace through faith in Christ's redemptive work. This is referred to as our initial sanctification, if you will, when we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ and we're justified before the Father. However, the journey through progressive sanctification to become more like Christ also begins at this point. And we can only do this through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we must submit and obey in the tests and trials and temptations of life. And so we're told, work it out with fear and trembling. Now the word work out here, thank you, Pete, I'm going to do my best. Categorize este means to press on to the finish, to completion, to perfection, if you will. It means to complete the effort and the work begun to accomplish the task to completion. In other words, go on, go on and become more like Christ until that day I call you home. The disciple of Christ, we have been sanctified, we've been set apart, but now as a new creation in Christ, we need to submit to the Holy Spirit, a application of God's principles and commands, right? And the word of God, so we work towards completion. And that completion ain't gonna end until either we are raptured or we take our last breath on earth. Only then will we pass over and that completion will be done. But guys, this is a marathon. We keep on going every day, striving to be like the Lord. And Ron and I were talking about this yesterday. I think it was you, Ron. Forgive my memory. But it's like, I said it, it's like a car going uphill. You can't go into neutral. Guess where you're going? Just backwards. This is a constant strive to get to the mountaintop. Amen? But our task on this side of eternity is to strive daily. Become more like Christ. More and more, let that fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in our lives. I talked to my neighbor yesterday. His wife has got cancer really bad, and I mean, we've been praying for her, but it's bad. And I said, Bill, what's the Lord trying to teach you through this? Maybe a servant's heart, because he's caring for his wife. He goes, man, this is hard. I said, I know. But maybe he's trying to teach you. What's he trying to teach you through this? I know it's, he goes, it's really hard watching my wife go through this. I said, I understand. And Teresa and I are there for them. We're right next door. But all these tests that we go through, molding us, making us more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. And really, this only reinforces what we looked at last week about the Word of God. We need to know the Word so we know the principles and commands of God so we can apply them to our lives. So the Holy Spirit has what to draw from and bring to memory when we find ourselves in the test, the trials, or temptations. Amen? Amen? And I have this. Listen carefully. Whenever a choice comes, whenever a decision comes, whenever an emotion rises up, compare it to Jesus Christ. Compare it to the teachings of Christ and compare it to the two greatest commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength or love your neighbor as yourself. And if your choice is yes to those like four quantities, if you will, or qualities, then you're right on the right path. If it's not, Take a step back and say, hmm, hmm. But if we're doing the will of God, becoming more like Christ, applying his teachings, looking in and fulfilling those two greatest commandments, then you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong, amen? Because he's our example. Amen. And the two words Paul uses here for the task are truly worth listening to. Working out that sanctification process with fear and trembling. And at the root of this statement really lies the holy God's disdain for sin, especially in those who have been redeemed by his son. Do you hear me? We work out our salvation, but at the root of becoming that way and working that out is we understand that our God has a disdain for sin. That's why he came into the world and died, so he could free us from that bondage. Listen carefully. Although the Lord is merciful, forgiving, and long-suffering, he will hold us accountable for disobedience a flagrant disregard for his holiness, and a flippant attitude towards sin. Oh, I can do this. I know I'm going to be forgiven. It's called presumptuous sin, and the Lord doesn't take that lightly. 
And listen, he has a flagrant, uh, uh, he has three reasons why he really has a disdain for sin. The first and foremost is that he's holy. And of course, when we look at the price that his son paid, the scriptures teach us that we should never take and trample underfoot the work of our Savior. Amen? Amen? Never trample underfoot. The second is this. We represent him. And we, when we walk in hypocrisy, it can do so much damage to leading the lost to salvation. When we say we belong to Christ and we proclaim Christ and we talk the talk and then we're not walking the walk, they're like, yeah, right? And I've been, in my early walk, I was guilty. I was saying this, but I was still tainted by the flesh. So we want to walk the walk. And it can do a lot of damage within the church. Do you hear me? It can cause other believers to stumble and can also cause division in the church when we don't walk as Jesus walked. And the third, listen carefully, he loves us enough to discipline us and keep us from the consequences of foolish choices. Do we not discipline our own children so that they won't get hurt or do something stupid that'll be dangerous to them? Of course we do. So you don't think our Heavenly Father's going to do that with us to keep us from severe consequences because we get a little smarter as we get older. Actually, a little dumber. We start doing stupider things. But let's get a better understanding of those words fear and trembling so we can really understand what Paul is saying here. The word fear is phobos, where we get the word phobia. And the one I used here is like arachnophobia, fear of spiders. I don't know the one for snakes, but I hate snakes. I almost sound like the guy from uh, Indiana Jones. Oh, snakes, give me the willies. They really do. And laugh if you will. I jog around a pond, and like three times, snakes have gone across my path, and I'm like, wow! And I jump out of the way. It's scared. You know, it's just jogging along, and all of a sudden, this thing goes, Brr! whoa! Scary. Snakes. And the word trembling comes from tremos, which we get the word tremor. And you know, after an earthquake, you get tremors. Well, it's the same thing. And these two things, we need to really glean their definitions, look at their definitions, but look at it in the light of Proverbs 1-7 where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's being alluded to here is to have a reverential fear and understanding of who God really is. To get a real picture of the Lord God. Family, what's being alluded to here is that reverential fear throughout both Testaments, Old Testament, New Testament, Look at the reaction of believers when they come in the presence of a holy God. Go read Exodus on Mount Sinai. What happens when the Lord shows himself? They fall down and tremble and say, Whoa, Moses, you go up. Leave us back here. Or the prophets. What did Isaiah say in Isaiah 6? Woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw the Lord of glory and he was petrified. Even Daniel. When he's standing there and the vision of the Lord comes, uh, Christophany, and he falls down, pale, as dead. And how about John? The one who ate with him. The one who leaned on him. But when he got a glimpse of the risen and resurrected and glorified Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, he fell down as dead because we will tremble in the presence of his holiness. And it'll only be by his grace and his resurrected new bodies that we can stand in his presence to eternity. But in this, we will fall and tremble. And it's the right response. Amen. And I feel bad for those who don't put their faith in Christ because they will fall and tremble when they see the holy God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. But listen, when we stand as believers and we fall in fear and tremble, it's not a fear of judgment. Our judgment was taken by Christ on the cross. Our wrath was taken by Christ on the cross. But when we see him, we should have fall and reverential awe because we understand, church, because we are saved of who he truly is. He is our friend that sticks closer to a brother, but he's not our buddy. He's not the big guy or the big man in the, in the sky. He's the holy, eternal creator and sustainer of all things, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, beyond our comprehension, wonderful. That's who we serve. And we would fall in reverential fear at his feet like John did and worship him. Amen? He's God. Read Revelation chapter 1, please. And I brought this out before. Hair as white as wool. 
eyes like fire, a body like burning bronze in all his majesty. And I brought this out a couple of weeks ago at the transfiguration. It came from without where he just, his glory was shown, his majesty was shown. And Peter did one of these. What do I do? I'll build some booths. He had no clue. He was petrified. Amen? Amen. And listen carefully. That within this reverential awe should be a fear of chastisement if we're going to veer off into sin. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. He disciplines us because he loves us and for the reasons we already spoke about. He cares about us as our heavenly father and he doesn't want to see us veer off into foolish and stupid consequences that can derail our relationship with him or cause others not to come to him. Amen? Listen to Hebrews 12, 5 to 6 and then 10b. It says this. Listen carefully. You have forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. It's out of his fatherly love to keep us from ourselves. Don't see it as, oh. It also is a wake-up call. Am I walking with the Lord? Am I doing the right thing? Other things happen to mold us into his image, but if we veer off, he's going to discipline us. And look at verse 10b. It says this, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. That's his goal for us. Child of God, we should desire to become holy as he is holy. And therefore, as James says, rejoice. Because the, when he disciplines us, we're maturing and persevering in our faith and becoming more like him. And as I said in the beginning of the message, we should rejoice when we become more like Christ. That's the ultimate purpose God has for us. So when we see that we're actually growing in our relationship, it should bring us joy. Amen? And let me add this in reference to working out our salvation with fear and trembling. There should also be, listen carefully, a healthy fear of our unredeemed flesh. We don't want that to rear its ugly head or the consequences that it can bring. We need to be real with ourselves. You hear me? Amen. Including yours truly. Basically, we're never to let our guard down and think that temptations of life cannot lure that flesh and that Satan is not looking for an opportunity to get us to choose sin over righteousness. Do you hear me? That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says this. Instru it instructs us that let him who thinks he stands take heed and lest he fall. Church, if we let down our God or in prideful arrogance we think we can't be lured into sin or given to sin, take heed lest you fall. We should always be on guard against those old bents of sin because Satan will look for the opportunities. When there's a little struggle in the house, when you're ill, when infirmity comes, when finances seem to wane, oh, doubt God. And can I take the other way to try to fix the remedy, the way the world would go, the way that Satan would have you go and bypass the will of the Lord and his loving, gracious kindness for you. Amen? That's why we have to be honest with ourselves, examine our hearts, and bend towards sin, and lean on the Holy Spirit, get into the Word of God where those areas we struggle with, and have that repertoire of scriptures to lean on, and let the Holy Spirit draw from this when those tests, trials, or temptations come. You've got to be in the Word, and you've got to be in prayer. And listen ca carefully. I have down here, avoid, as best as we can, those situations that would tweak those areas of sin. If you came from an alcohol drug background, don't go into the pub to listen to the music or have a hamburger. Go to the diner. You don't even want to smell the smells, if you will. And even I have down here, even as we go to things like weddings or uh, retirement parties, family gatherings, if you have certain, know certain people are going to be there that really get your goat, family members that you're rather blessed with like a brick than, you know, a Christmas gift, then be prayed up. Like you know that person's going to be there. Be prayed up and have the right spirit going in, if you will, so that you what? Exemplify Christ and you don't give in to the flesh. Put the full armor on and go into battle. Every morning, put the full armor on. Amen? And to bring this all together, Paul goes on in verse 13. It says, For it is God 
who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And again, we see what seems to be contradictory here, but it's not. Listen carefully. While we're working out, God's working in to mold us into the image of his son. Here's the situation, brother or sister. How did you respond? And as we respond by applying the principles of God's word, God's working within and nurturing that fruit. Doesn't a farmer go out? and fertilize and water and nurture so that it produces a good crop? Well, so is the Father doing with us. And listen, you're not going to know if you're growing in an area or if you're able to pass a test unless we get the test. Teacher, how do you know your kids are doing something? you got to give them a test to see if they've comprehended or grown in the knowledge that you're putting forth. And so the Father does with us. All right? He's molding us, and he wants to cultivate that fruit in our lives. And he's also preparing us preparing us for the life calling, for what he has for each one of us. Every one of you has a gift of talent that God wants to use out there and in here. And I'm going to get a plug for ministry. We need people to help out in the church. I'm going to be talking to the board. We're going to need ushers and stuff. So as we put it out there, if God lays it on your heart, get involved. Get involved. God's gifted you with something to use to edify your brothers and sisters. And when you're not involved, you're holding out on your church family. That's not Italian or Jewish guilt. It's the real deal, all right? I have down here, look, pastoring can be a challenge, but it's a wonderful privilege to be used by God in such a way. I mean, it's humbling. It's really humbling. Listen to me. I never thought that this was God's plan for my life. I thought for sure after special ed teaching, I would have had a nice two acres in Lancaster. I know my wife's going to say no. A horse, go out, curry comb it down in the morning, take a nice ride, do my little garden, And when my time came, just plant me in the dirt with the rest of the stuff. But the Lord said, no, got something else for you. I'm like, really? I never thought. I didn't feel equipped or worthy of a task. But let me say this. I know he has and he will equip. And the only way that I'm worthy is because of who I am in Christ. That is the only way. Because I was a wretched sinner saved by grace. And so are you guys. And guess what? He's got something for each and every one of us. He'll equip us in whatever capacity he wants to use us. If we're willing to say like the prophet, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, use me. Because he's got something for every one of us. As they say in baseball, step up to the plate. And again, what we see here is one of the greatest paradoxes of Scripture, that while we're working out to become more like Christ, God is working within, which is the, in essence, We can't work without unless God's working within because we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're working together with the Lord to grow in him and become more like him. That's why uh, Jesus says this in John 15, 4 and 5. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So as we're in Christ, and God is working in us, and we're working outwardly to become more like Jesus, he's producing that fruit in our lives, and people will see it and see something different about you. Amen? And let me explain that the word work here in verse 13 in the Greek, energio, I got that one, Pete, and it's where we get a word energy. We could say that the Lord is our energy, the power source in our progressive sanctification, but we have to plug into that power source. Do you hear me? We have to plug in in order to what? Become like him and do the work he's called us to do. You're not going to do it on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. It's his power through the Holy Spirit that, what, conforms us into the image of Christ as we submit and obey. It's his power that enables us to overcome our flesh and live according to the word. It's his power that enables us to do the work he's called us to do. Amen? Enables us and equips us. And we do it, what? For the good pleasure of our Father. Because he's pleased when his children are conformed to the image of his Son and do what he's called us to do. And church, this should be our pleasure also. Because if the Father has something for us, I can tell you it's the best. Because he wants the best for us. No matter the conditions, the situations, 
or the position we may find ourselves in. If we're doing God's will, it's the best thing for us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Very simply, church, God calls, we respond. He equips, we obey and do. Therefore, he's pleased, and so are we, because we know we're doing our Father's will, and it's the best thing for us. And I have down here, it's simple in in thought, but it ain't that easy in attitude or action. We have to be willing to submit and let Christ shine to us. And I have down here, plug in and be a 100-watt light bulb instead of a dull fluorescent. God wants to shine. Amen? So Paul goes on to instruct us, completely understanding our humanity, that like Jesus, we are to fill... Re- oh, boy, this is where it's, the rubber is going to hit the road. To fill God's will without grumbling and disputing. Oh, Listen to verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Family, this is the attitude we're, have, we're supposed to take when we work out our salvation, without grumbling or disputing. All righty? And the word grumbling... Here we go, Pete, comes from the word gagusmos, which refers to something akin to muttering when we're irritated by someone or some condition. Come on, for you old folks, remember the bear? That old bear, the grumpy old bear? Remember the cartoon? I'll give you a better example. Honey, don't hit me with a frying pan. When you have a little discussion and all of a sudden you go in the living room and you hear from the kitchen, just enough to, that you can hear what's going on, but you don't know what they're saying. But you know somebody's murmuring in the kitchen. And you know what? That's time when you want to get in the car and take a little ride. But, um, but that kind of thing. And we can, murmur, uh, we can mutter against God also. And really what it stems from is a self said notion that the situation we find ourselves is undeserving. God, I don't deserve this situation. What are you bringing into my life? We often feel to realize that God is using everything, everything, to teach us and mold us into his image. Everything. Life is a, one big giant test to mold us into Christ. Amen? And look, he wants us to become more like Jesus. So how, again, are we going to know for achieving the goal if we don't pass the test? So we're going to be tested, but that's okay. All right? All right. And listen, the word disputing in the word Greek is dialogismos. That's where we get the word dialogue. And listen to what? It refers to someone who's always questioning, arguing, and debating. Black, white, yes, no, up, down. And it just causes animosity in that kind of situation. All righty? Remember the plight of the Israelites? Do you remember from, the promised, uh, from Egypt to the Promised Land? Here they're being delivered from bondage after 400 years. They get out into the desert. What is this stuff we got to eat? It ain't macaroni, it ain't meatballs, it's manna. Manna. Day after day after day, and they complained and they murmured. And then poor Moses. Imagine over three million people you got to listen to. I can't even imagine. Right? And then as they're going, uh, who's it, Dathan, Abiram, they, they rebel against Moses, and they're really rebelling against the Lord. Hey, we're Levites too. You can't tell us what to do. And how about the spies? They get to the promised land. They come back with these big clusters. The place is great. Oh, we can't go in. There were giants in the land. Meanwhile, God's saying, you remember the sea? Do you remember what happened? All right. And God said, I'm going to take you in. But they spread a bad report, and that generation died in the desert. They murmured and disputed and grumbled against Moses and against God. And listen to what the word of God says for us in light of that. Hebrews 10, 9 to 11 tells us, We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So need I say more about grumbling and disputing? Because when we grumble and murmur over our situations, we're actually grumbling and murmuring against God and what he's trying to do in our lives. Trust me, I don't want surgery. And I thank, you know, my friend Rich and my brother Joe were like, oh, wait. I'm like, great. You know, they told me some of the effects. I'm like, oh, wonderful. And, the, and listen, the purpose of the 40 years in the desert and the test and trials was to remove the stench of Egypt from their hearts and their minds and to get them to trust God completely. So the tests and trials of our lives are to remove the stench 
of this world from our hearts and minds and get us to trust the God we say we believe in completely. Do you get it? He wants us out of the world, our feet out of the mud, and he wants our eyes on him. He wants us to do his will while we're here, but he wants our eyes on heaven, even in the world we live in now. Keep your eyes on things above. And listen, he will discipline us, but not discipline for disobedience, but discipline in the way that a soldier is trained for military. Do you hear what I'm saying? you see the difference? When a recruit enters boot camp, they have a civilian mindset. Their mind is on all the things they came from in the world, all the things they were involved in. But they need to be conformed to the military life and lifestyle. Yes, veterans, you are conformed to their lifestyle. And church is the same with us. When we enter the family of God, we're being disciplined, molded into the image of our Lord. And sometimes the training is hard and difficult. Amen? But we're trained up for spiritual warfare because every day we wake up and we have the residual effect of this that we have to battle. We have a world system that is going the complete opposite direction than the word of God tells us to go. We have Satan and his enemies, the principalities and powers that are looking to take down Christians. So we have a war ahead of us every day. So we have to be disciplined and trained for that battle. Amen? And listen, I'd rather come out as a Navy SEAL than the guy who's washing the dishes in the kitchen. So I want to take my training seriously so that I'm strong for the Lord. And so should we all. I don't want to be the cook in the kitchen. Amen? I probably end up poisoning somebody. And look, as we get into this, as we walk in humility, submission, and obedience to the Father's will, we avoid selfishness and empty conceit as we put the interests of others first and obey God. It's very simple. And the word blameless, when it talks about being blameless, means without defect. And this innocent refers to something that is pure or unmixed. When he says he wants us to be innocent, that means he wants us to be pure, unmixed. So I, I thought of it like this, if the teaching earth science. If you were digging, right, Rich? If you were digging in your yard and you wanted pure sand, because we live on the island here and everything is basically sand, what you would do is take that stuff you're digging and you would put it through a sieve and the rocks and the, and the concrete and the junk would stay on top and then the pure sand would come through and you would have the purity, the unmixed sand granules that you wanted. Well, the Lord's doing the same with us. We sometimes go through the sieve of tests and trials so he gets rid of the impurities and that what comes forth is the pure thing that he's looking for. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. And it says we'll also be without fault, which means to be without blemish like the spotless lamb as we reflect the spotless lamb in our lives. The only fault that we should have in the sight of men should be evident is the fault for and representing Christ to the lost. The only fault they should find in us is he's a disciple, she's a disciple of Christ, and that's the fault I find with them. And trust me, they will as our world decays more and more. As we stand for the Lord, I told you last week, there are countries, even a state in our own union, that call the Bible hate speech. But if the only fault we have is because we are identified with Christ, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Amen. Lord. Amen? Amen? Praise God. For we are the light and darkness. We're a beacon of truth in the midst of all the lies that we see as we proclaim the gospel that saved us, changed us, and is available to everyone who will receive it. And we're almost there. As Paul finishes, he encourages and exhorts his readers to the fact that as they hold on to the word of life and finish the race, he will glory and rejoice in the fact that these believers, in whom he had an integral part in leading to Christ and to discipling, that they will be at the beam of seed and judgment, they will be accepted into God's kingdom, and they will be rewarded for his faithfulness. And this is what Paul is rejoicing in. Not he's saying, oh, I glory and rejoice because there was something about me. To... No, he's rejoicing to see souls that were saved, that are going to stand in front of Christ and be accepted into his kingdom and then rewarded for their faithfulness. He's rejoicing in that, that, he, that God would allow him to have a part in bringing others to the Savior. So he rejoices. Listen to verses 16 to 18. It says, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Again, this is a shepherd. 
He's bringing Christ to others. He's teaching them about Christ, and this is his joy that they would mature in the faith, that he didn't labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. I'm rejoicing that you came to Christ. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way as you share your joy with me. There's the joy that they're in Christ and they have an eternal hope. Paul is an under-shepherd of the Lord's people, did not look to his own interests, but lived a life of sacrifice unto the Lord so as to be a light to a perverse and crooked generation who needed Christ. He was their witness, and his joy will be that they came to faith, and he will share with them in the eternal glory. Family, Jesus' life was one of selfless ministry, fulfilling the will of his Father. The Apostle Paul was a life of selfless ministry who looked to fulfill the will of his heavenly Father. And we have been instructed to follow in the same footsteps as them, that our lives would be a selfless ministry, walking the example of Christ, so as to lead others, disciple others, and someday, together with them, rejoice before the heavenly throne. I think one of the greatest joys in heaven is when you will turn and you'll be like, and they'll say, you witnessed to me. You gave to that missionary who came to me and shared the gospel, and now I'm in glory. Won't there, I mean, come on, Wade, when you see that young man in glory, and you were instrumental in bringing the gospel, that's got to be in glory, just wonderful. It's wonderful now. And this morning, we'll take part in communion. And remember the life example that Christ left us. We'll remember his sacrificial death that saved us and the grace of God that drew us into a personal relationship. And as a result, we can rejoice now because we're in him and our eternal salvation is secure. But we will also rejoice in the future when we stand before him and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. And you look around and I'll see all your beautiful faces and we will rejoice, and we'll see Pastor Al Stein and rejoice, and I will see Joe Sapienza and rejoice because he's the pastor who shared the gospel that morning and I got saved, and we will rejoice together. Every nation, every color, every ethnic group, no denominational boundaries, just the body of Christ rejoicing in our Savior. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Family, we're saved by grace through faith, but we're also called to faithfulness, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. While God works within us to mold us into the image of his Son, and it will be exemplified in our obedience and reflection of Christ's likeness in and through our lives. And again, I'll say it's a marathon, and we just keep on going, working it out as God's working within, leaning on the Holy Spirit to become more like Christ, to witness to the lost, to use our gifts and talents to build up the body of Christ. That's the call for the church. And that's the call on each one of our lives. And the biggest thing that the Father wants from us is to become more like Jesus. Because when we are, our light will shine brightly. Amen? So as we prepare for communion, I'd really like to play this, play this song. Listen to it. There are no words because there were no words. I couldn't find them unless Matt found them. But listen to it as we prepare for communion. Amen? Matt, if you can roll that. Oh, and let me just say this. If uh, you're watching via the airways, we have to cut you off because of copyright laws. Sorry. Talk to the government.
Is that your desire, church? Yes. That Christ be glorified in and through our lives? Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord, because that's what the Father desires of us, that we be molded into his image and exemplify him. And we're called to work that out with fear and trembling as he works in us through the power of his spirit to do that. The paradox of Christianity. Amen? With that said, let's go to the one who redeemed us and thank him, thank him that we could have access to the throne of grace because of his finished work. Amen? And Paul wrote this, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, as we have studied through the beginning of Philippians chapter 2 and into it, Lord God, from before the creation of the world, it says that a body was prepared for you, my God, that you would come into the world and take on flesh, divest yourself of your divine prerogatives, that you would become a bondservant and walk in complete humility to set the example for those who would be your disciples. And Lord, you were obedient even to death on the cross. Lord, we thank you that you came, that you came to redeem us and save us from the eternal consequence of hell and sin and death. My God, we are so grateful today. We are so grateful for the salvation we have in you. Oh, Lord God, that we would glorify you in and through our lives. Help us, Lord. Help us. Let's partake of the bread, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, my God. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as you often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, again, we thank you. We thank you, my God, for all that you went through. All that you went through, Lord, culminating on the cross where you shed your precious blood unto death, that you were the spotless lamb who came the sacrificial lamb and died for us, O God. You are the fulfillment of the Passover, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you that we're washed white as snow in your precious blood, that we are justified before your Father and seen as righteous in his eyes. Almighty God, we just thank you and we look forward to that day when we'll drink of the cup again in glory, in glory, Lord, and see you in your majesty, and we will be with you forever. Let's partake of the cup, church. Again, Lord, we just thank you so much. Thank you for our salvation. Holy Spirit, do the work in us and through us that we would become more like Christ. Lord God, that we would just develop those fruits of your agape love, Lord, the goodness, the kindness, the peace, the joy, the compassion, the humility, the patience, Lord, the goodness, all those things, and have that self-control, that time of testing and trial to trust you. Lord, be with each one of us, we pray, and help us become more like your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.